Uh, if we've not met yet, my name is Matt. I lead the team that leads Mosaic and my privilege to preach today. So if you've got a Bible, why don't you get those out? We're going to go initially to Matthew chapter 6, and then we're going to go into Luke uh, in just a little bit. Um, just to say, uh, in the last few weeks, we've, been man- we've managed to buy some translation equipment, and so Anastasia is going to be translating uh, into Ukrainian live. And uh, they're up in the balcony at the moment. So if you hear this little murmuring behind you, then that's what's going on. And uh, we should just say thank you to Anastasia for that. Amazing. (laughs) Wonderful. Well, imagine if Jesus, instead of me, was preaching today. (laughs) It might be a little bit better than what you're going to get. But I wonder what he would talk about, like what passage he would turn to, what he would see in our congregation that needs addressing. My guess is at some point, if we gave him long enough, I'm convinced that he would want to talk to us about generosity, giving and finances, because it was his number one topic for preaching. Half of the parables in the New Testament are about money and finance. Jesus refers to money one in every 10 verses in the Gospels. And he speaks about money four times more than faith and four times more than prayer. And so for the first time in a few years, we are going to look at countercultural giving today. So why don't you turn to your neighbor and say, I'm so glad I came today. (laughs) Now, you may ask, what does Jesus have to say about our money? And especially if you're not a Christian, you're just sort of on a bit of a journey of faith. What does Jesus, someone who lives 2,000 years ago, have to say about the way that we spend our money? Well, at the heart of his teaching, he claimed that there was a huge spiritual battle between God and money. And Jesus basically asks, who will you worship? Will you worship God or will you worship money? And the question is, why does he ask that question? Well, Matthew 6, verse 24, next verse. No one can serve two masters, says Jesus. Either you will hate the one and love the other or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. So Jesus gets to the heart of the issue. He asks, what is more important in your life, God or money? And of course, like no one worships actual money. I mean, if you do, I mean, it's a bit weird, but you know, we don't get the notes and the coins out and then sort of bow down to them. It's rather what the money can do in your life, what it promises you, what opportunities it gives you, what you can spend it on. And Jesus is saying, your money serves you or you serve it. And that is profound. Francis Bacon, uh, English philosopher from the 16th century, he said this, money is a great servant, but a poor master. And so as we start this series, I just want you to reflect in your hearts, is money going to be a servant or a master in your life? Because you can end up serving money or money serving you. I want you to imagine in your house or your flat or wherever it is that you live, you have a butler or a maid. And they do all the jobs around the house for you. They feed the cats. (laughs) They clean the car, they make the dinner, they iron your clothes. Imagine how wonderful that would be. But you, when they're in your house, imagine you had no actual idea of what they did or where they were. You had no clue at any point what they were actually doing. You'd be a pretty poor master if that was the case. You see, money is that servant And we should be the master who is in charge. We should know what our servants are up to. Is it doing good work? Is it coming and going as the master wishes? 
If not, then it's the servant that's the true master. See, God gives us this resource to use really wisely and generously as good stewards. And if you're a Christian here, we ultimately are here to serve God, and money is here to help us serve as we serve God. But many of us, I think, find probably unconsciously that it's often us that serve the money. So we're given three weeks this subject. Uh, as we've always said, this is a heart issue. It's a discipleship issue. It's a theme that really will, I hope, expose how important is your stuff compared to God. And so it's going to ask this series a few questions. I've got them on the screen for you. It's going to ask, are you content enough in God for him to be more important than all the world tells you you should own or consume? We're going to look at whether you're willing to prioritize Jesus, his kingdom, and the church over your own wants and desires. And are you willing to give up a few of these things in order to be more generous? I mean, they are tough questions. But answering those questions, or even your response as I read them out, will reveal a bit, a little bit, of how much money has got its hold over you. And listen, in the room, I think most of us don't have loads of spare cash. The question is, though, are we prioritizing what God wants us to do with it? Is it serving his purposes? Or is it just like a no-go area? Like you're here today, and you're like, you, you cannot speak into this area of my life. It's buttoned up, it's dialed down, and it's mine. Some of you have got pretty good incomes, like in terms of the UK average, which is about £26,000. You're actually way above that. But the reality is your outgoings are really high. And so my hope over the next three weeks is that some of your priorities are challenged. Because sometimes, I know we do this in our family, we can sort of assume things that we spend our money on first are sort of non-negotiables. And God gets, I guess, what's left. And usually there's not much left. And I guess if that's you, over these next few weeks, I just really want to ask and encourage you just to be keen to hear what God wants to say to you about that. For you not to treat it as locked down and immovable but ready and open to what God wants to say. Some of you have very little. And so for you, every penny counts. And what we're going to see today, but over these next few weeks, that Jesus particularly loves it when you give, because your giving is sacrificial. Some of you have debt. And obviously, I would encourage you to seek help where it's needed, but ultimately you can still embody the generosity that we're talking about with your love and your time, not just with your money. And some of you are poor at managing money. Perhaps some of you, how many of you are spenders more than savers? Like, no one's admitting to be a spender. It's all right. It's a safe place. I've got my hand up too. I'm a spender. There's like four of us in the room. That can't be the truth. How many of you are savers? Oh, yeah. See, that feels a bit more godly, doesn't it? So you're all like, that's me. <laughs> For you savers, obviously, like, be sensible. Perhaps you need to save a bit less and give a bit more. And f- That didn't go down well. And, <laughs> and spenders, perhaps you need to spend a little bit less so you can give a little bit more. Managing your finances is absolutely key if we're going to be a generous-hearted people. And uh, Helen Bolton just encouraged me to just remind us that we have a Managing Your Money course starting in October. And these courses are some of the best ways to get a grip of your finances. And Helen Bolton, could you just wave? She's just here. If you want to speak to her about that, encourage that. And listen, some of you are giving really generously. Like, it doesn't really matter the amount, but some of you just know that that's that's how I live. That's how I roll. I I give generously to the church, to other causes. We're just generous. If that's you, I really don't want you to just sort of, I don't know, just sit there smugly 
over the next few weeks, like, I've got this one, I'm safe. And maybe judge people around you that aren't quite where you are. But for you, I just my prayer would be you remain soft-hearted and open. Because it's so easy to think, I'm good. This is for everyone else. But God might have some stuff for you over these next few weeks. And let me be really honest. I'm particularly wanting to address anyone in the room that doesn't give anything to the church, to other charities. For you, it's just all yours. My hope is that you wouldn't clam up at this point, that you'd be open to shifting your posture. And obviously, I'm, I'm, the, I'm one of the pastors in the church. I'm always going to be a little bit biased. But I think the church would say to you, there is a joy and delight that comes from giving that you are missing out on. It's like this adventure of faith that only comes when you put yourself into a place of dependency on God. And so actually, us, me telling you that don't give anything, you know, I'm inviting you into this journey, which for many of us has been so satisfying and an adventure in God that we wouldn't have if we just kept everything locked down. And so I don't want anyone to give out guilt or pressure, but I hope as we get to the end of these three weeks, you meet with the grace of God, and as you do so, you aspire to the grace of giving. So that's my hope and prayer. And lastly, I just want to acknowledge that for some of you in the room, it's particularly complicated. So perhaps you've married to someone who isn't a Christian or isn't a believer, and so managing your finances is, is really complicated. Or you're married and you've got very different views in your marriage on what to give and what not to give. And I'd so encourage you as we look at this together to find some safe places where you can talk about that. Talk together and talk to others. Because there is a way through for you. So to help, we're going to follow this all up in our mission groups, which are our small groups. Uh, every week for the next three weeks, the mission group leaders have been uh, given some notes and some questions to ask. They'll be arriving, I think, by the end of today. Uh, for this coming week. And so for the next three weeks, we want every mission group just to uh, spend their time looking at this together. I've got lots of people nervously like, what? What's going on? Tom will send that all out by the end of today, hopefully. Yeah. So let's open our Bibles. Well done, everyone. We doing all right? Yeah, great. Let's open our Bibles. Luke 21, 1 to 4. And I've asked Peter to come up to read these verses to us. So let's welcome Peter up as he comes up. Luke 21, verses 1 to 4. As Jesus looked up, he saw the rich putting their gifts into the temple treasury. He also saw a poor widow putting two very small copper coins. Truly I tell you, he said, this poor widow has put in more than all the others. All these people give their gifts out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in all she had to live on. The Lord bless the reading of his words in Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to picture the scene. There's a slow-moving line of people that leads to a very small square room that's lined with metal collection boxes. And the boxes have these uh, horns on them extending out to receive the people's offerings. As you can imagine, the coins are constantly clanging as they're cast into these receptacles. Jesus is watching people give. He's not interested in how much they give, but, uh, or sorry, what people give. He's more interested in how they are giving. As wealthy citizens pass by and make really loud clanging noises by virtue of the fact they've got lots of coins to put in the treasury, they draw favored glances from the priests who are watching people give. Jesus notices a lady draw up 
and take out two insignificant coins, mites, the smallest currency used by the Romans. And she tosses both of these lightweight coins into the big metal box. Their faint click is drowned out by the heavy clanking of all the substantial gifts going on around them. So no one notices her. After all, what difference just a couple of little coins are going to make? But Jesus notices. He's impressed and pleased and so singles this woman out to the entire multitude and cheerfully confesses that her offerings are more important than those made by the men and women of wealth and prestige. It is a remarkable story. So what is Jesus doing by bringing attention to this poor widow? Well, I've got six observations from the text. Number one, even though it's about a poor widow's gift, Jesus doesn't rebuke the wealthy for giving at the temple. All should give, rich and poor, and everyone in between. The issue is about the sacrifice being made. Amen? Number two, this story tells us that small amounts are really important. So if you feel your giving doesn't make much of a difference compared to the overall need, you need to think again. Jesus saw the two widow's coins and said she had put in more than anyone else. And so as you bring just what you can afford sacrificially, heaven rejoices at what you do. Thirdly, external obedience is always trumped by internal obedience. So you may look good to everyone, but Jesus knows what's really happening on the inside and what the giving really costs. So let me just make sense of that. If you're a family that earns 50,000 pounds, joint salaries, you may not feel the impact of a thousand pound gift to someone or something as much as a low earning single or married couple that have made huge sacrifices to give 50 pounds. But you see, on the outside, the 1,000 pounds looks like this, the dramatic big gift. But God looks at the heart. That's such good news. Number four, both the wealthy and the poor must beware the bypassing of the heart. But the wealthy are in more danger as often their sacrifice is less. We can give on autopilot rather with love and faith. And for those of us that have got standing orders, perhaps you know our giving goes out, we are in danger of just almost losing the impact and the sacrifice. It's not that the gift doesn't count for anything, but we can almost give on autopilot. Fifthly, the widow gave all she had to live on. That's what the verse tells us. And so had to trust God fully because she was so vulnerable and defenseless. If the wealthy don't give sacrificially, then it may mean they are never challenged about where they truly put their hope and trust. And so it's good to be jolted by radical examples. What does it mean to give sacrificially? I think it means giving until it hurts. Like it costs you something, you feel the pinch, it affects your life in some way. It means that you perhaps can't do certain things. It impacts your expenditure or your savings or your lifestyle. In the case of the ham and eggs breakfast, the chicken contributed, but the pig gives sacrificially. <laughs> That's the difference. Some of you are just getting that, but that's fine. Let's make sure we don't give any old thing. The widow gave all she had to live on, so let's just make sure our hearts are right. All I'm saying is take time to ask the Lord, what do you want us to give this month? How can I give more? I mean, there's an amazing question to pray to God. How can I give more? It's my privilege and joy to give, Lord. Help me give sacrificially. You see, if your giving leave, leaves the bank without a thought, perhaps it's time to ask God, what next or who next? Or how can I use my resources for your purposes? 
And sixthly, she gives him faith. She gives him faith. She trusts God to provide for her. She gives all that she has. In order to give, she needed to come, she needed God to come through for her in an extraordinary way. And so we need to trust in God's promises for every need to be met, for my family, for my church, if we're to start giving. And I wonder what you lean on. What do you trust to enable such bold and radical generosity? These are three of my favorite verses that I try and rely on when I think about the faith for giving. Philippians 4. Next verse, please. Uh, next slide, please. Is it still going, Emmanuel? It's stuck. Let me read them out. Philippians 4, verse 19. My God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. My God will supply every need of yours. 2 Corinthians 9. God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. And let's read Matthew 6 together. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. And our experience as a family, uh, as a married couple, and many others we know of in this church is again and again, God comes good when we take baby steps of faith. A couple of years ago, a um, number of years ago now, we had a special offering in church. And uh, Pip and I, uh, three young kids, just me earning, uh, our budget was, you know, we, we had nothing to give. And so we prayed, Lord, we want this certain amount because we want to give into this offering. And we prayed and prayed. And literally a day before the offering, the money came in. And I remember, even as the money coming in, saying, should we keep it? Is this, <laughs> is this something we should give away? I feel like the Lord's blessing us right now. And just how corrupt is my heart. I'm, I married well. But just that posture of, Lord, we want to give. We've got nothing. And it just feels, that's a really great prayer because it feels very pure. It feels like my motives are good at that point, even though even when I get the money, I still want to keep it. There's this sense in which, Lord, you know, we, we don't have anything, but you can provide. I remember that being a student, and I was helping lead the Christian Union, and UCCF uh, wanted to take us off to train us so we knew how to lead this Christian Union. And I think we needed our team about £400 to take us to this residential, to pay for the trip, uh, to pay for our time there, and none of us as students had that money. And so that was one of the first times I can remember saying, why don't we pray that God would provide? And people are like, what? What? That seems a really radical thing to do. And so we prayed, and God gave us the money. I mean, incredible. And I, you, you sort of wonder as Christians, why, why do we doubt that? Why do we think that God doesn't want to provide for us in that way? But, you know, over the years, our experience is that finance, giving a proportion of our income and trusting God to provide is the one place we can test God. Malachi 3 verse 10 says this, Bring the whole tithe, the 10% of what you have, into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing, there will not be room enough to store it. It's so fascinating. God normally says in the Bible, do not test me. And this is the one place he gives permission for us to push things a little bit more with him. He seems to love it when we need to trust him to provide for our needs and to provide so we can be generous. So look, the widow in the temple treasury gives us six things to do. But I guess I just want to be really practical. What does it mean to be that sacrificially generous in everyday life? Am I talking about making sure you sort of put your hand up when you're out and it's your time to buy a round of drinks? Am I talking about I don't know, 
giving a few quid away to a local charity? Am I talking about just you being willing to loan me your lawnmower when I ask and not get too protective about your plino or whatever it is? What does this look like? Well, you may have heard of tithing, which is giving the first 10% of your money to God. And you may have even heard preachers say, your first 10% belongs to God. And I totally disagree with that. Totally. All of it belongs to God. Not some little first 10%. And it's ironic. We sing about this all the time. Take my life. I surrender all. Lord, you are worthy of it all. Just 10% though of what I've got in the bank. <laughs> How much should you give to the church? Well, we're going to try and unpack this. But I just think you cannot get away from the New Testament where it, there's a consistent theme of 10%. And then the early church not only embodied that, but they seemed to go beyond that and pushed on towards lives of great generosity. And so my advice is don't get too hung up about getting things down to the decimal point. Rather, what my heart is for all of you is to excel in the grace of giving. Just excel in it. 2 Corinthians 8 verse 7. But just as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in your love for us, see that you also excel in this grace of And I just think all of us need to work towards that. And it's obviously about a lifestyle of generosity that I think includes tithing and giving to the work that we're doing as a church. You know, what your giving does, it's so great to have the guys talking about Zambia because our giving goes to affect lives in that way. If you give to the church, it releases pastor, pastors that should be equipping you for ministry. It pays for renting buildings so that we can gather. It pays for people that invest in your children and your young, uh, your youth. It supports people who help others get out of debt. Or it releases people to do work in prisons or to serve our children. It means that you are part of a church family that is absolutely committed to the up of following Jesus to the in of building community and the out of joining God's mission to make disciples locally and globally. It goes towards Alpha courses that introduce people to new life in Jesus. It goes towards this vision that we have here of the sort of community God's trying to gather together, one that's diverse, different ages, different cultures, working out what it is to do life together. For this congregation particularly, we meet on a university campus. And so our prayer is particularly for young adults, for students, for people in those early years of life to find Jesus and set a course towards him for the rest of their lives. Now, as a church, God's speaking to us about encounter, what it is to encounter the Holy Spirit. We just know that fruitfulness lies as we uh, make room and make time for us to be filled afresh again and again with the Holy Spirit. It's him in us that produces fruitfulness, that makes an impact to the people around us and makes us more godly. But the grace of giving just reaches so much beyond just what we're trying to do as a church family. It impacts the sort of community you and I experience. It means that you are all soft-hearted when perhaps there's a fresh appeal or a fresh need in the community. We find a, a refugee <coughs> needs housing, and we say to the church, who's got an oven? Who's got a sofa? Who's got bed linen? Who's got a chest of drawers? And together we rise up and say, we can do that. I've got three chest of drawers. I can get, get rid of one, or whatever it is. It means that when someone has a baby or someone has to go to the hospital, we go again in cooking that meal, that same meal that you do every time for those rotors that you've absolutely perfected. You go again because together with 20-odd people providing a meal for three weeks, it is life-changing for people. 
So it means they can crack on with whatever the crisis is before them. It means that we open our homes. And so for, for many of you, you've got a spare room. You've got a spare sofa. And there's always people that need housing or accommodation, need a family they want to live with. And you're saying, yeah, we're willing to sacrifice a bit of our privacy so that we can have an open home to, to show true hospitality towards others. And then for many of us, it's just giving time which is probably our most precious quality right now. And you have time to those that need it. So listen, uh, you've uh, I've gone on long enough. To finish, I wanted you to hear a real-life story of someone that's gone on that journey from just sort of, I guess, attending Mosaic to experiencing God transform their hearts so that they're stepping towards giving. So Adam Saul, why don't you come down? Let's give Adam a huge round of applause. Hello. Um, is anybody else thinking about a ham sandwich? Or is it just me? Um, but yeah, it's great to see you all. Morning, church. Uh, so I'm just going to talk to you briefly for a little bit about my journey, basically through giving and sort of obedience to that. So uh, a little bit about me, I uh, grew up in a Christian home and uh, so giving and sort of generosity has just sort of been baked into the pie a little bit in terms of time or um, yeah, resources. But um, while I love my parents, uh, one of the problems that they didn't do was financial education. So understanding what you do with money, how does it work, why is it good to tithe, why is it good to give, that was something that they just sort of fell down on a little bit. And so as a result, you kind of have to look for it yourself. But what that meant was instead of me going, hmm, maybe I should look at the Bible, uh, I went, oh, let's look on YouTube and other videos that will tell you about investments and tell you about this, this, and this. And none of them were from a biblical point of view. And so what they tell you is save your money, don't spend it, save it on what you want, spend it on what you want. It's all about that. It's all about control. Don't give it away. And so my attitude uh, going into the workforce about 10 years ago was, uh, great, I've got my money, but now I uh, need to do that, which was save it, control it, do what I need to do. And tithing or giving in that kind of way never really came into it. And over time, uh, that became ingrained and became something that was just the norm. And uh, as time went on, that you know, goes up. And so when there's a giving appeal, I'd maybe give, but realistically not. I go, mm, well, oh, I've had a bit of a weird month, so maybe I won't give today. Or, yeah, I could give a fiver, but mm, yeah, maybe I won't give a fiver. And so before we knew it, it becomes a hardening area. And actually, it was an area where um, whenever I was challenged on it, I would just say, no, we're just going to not deal with that. We're going to go somewhere else. Or, oh, yeah, let's spend our money on this. And that means that we don't really have any money to give. So most of my life I've worked low-income jobs, um, and as a result of that I've thought, well, I don't really have the money to give. <laughs> um, anybody else can relate? And being in a position there where that becomes ingrained as well, where oh, well, once I get a job that earns this kind of cash, that's when I'll give, because that's when I can afford to do it, because the things I'm buying at the moment are things I really need. And as I'm standing here now, you realize that a lot of things that you have don't really need. And uh, one of the reasons for that is that it's, it's led into this becoming an, an ingrained thing of, well, I just, I'm always on these low-income jobs and have been for, for most of my sort of working career. And so that becomes a thing of, once I get there, I'll do that. But I'm not there yet, so I'm not going to do that right now. And the change has really happened in the past few years. Um, always been brought up in a Christian home, as I said, and that's always been a part of my faith uh, and to living that out but as I got into my 30s it was something that I thought was something that started to make a bit more sense but also was was starting to become challenged more as I looked around the world and what was going on and trends and forces come in in terms of your worldview and how you live and how you act and the main thing was that I was saying God I really want to go deeper with my faith I really want to be in a position where you are Lord um, but not over finances and so this became a situation where realistically I had to put my money where my mouth was 
because ultimately, if I'm going to do this, and I'm going to believe that God is sovereign. It doesn't just mean he's sovereign over careers or children or anything else. It's everything in my life. And that became a real uh, challenge over the past few years as uh, it's been a tough year um, in terms of jobs. I've had four jobs in less than 12 months. Uh, it's been a real test in terms of faith for um, God's provision. And I just want to point out that throughout all of my life, I've never been in a position where God has not met that need. So it's always been a situation where I've always had food in the fridge, I've always had uh, money to pay rent, and I've always had money to pay my bills. But there's been times where you go, this is, this is getting a bit tight, uh, <laughs> what's going on? And over these past two years, it's been a real gentle correction of God changing my heart on this issue and being in a position where uh, that becomes, especially over this last year, where you're thinking, God, I really need you to come through because I really don't have very much and payday is not giving me what I need to pay for all of the things that I actually need rather than want. And so it's been a situation where I've been felt very challenged to uh, do that in my recent uh, situation. So I'm starting a university course in two weeks' time. But until then, I, as part of having these four jobs in this year, it's been very tumultuous in terms of those finances. And God, but God has provided in all kinds of different ways, and we've even got time for me to go through it over this, uh, in this time. But one of the things I will say is that there's been a job that's been paying uh, over the past three months as a temp job. So that's just been weekly payments. But the problem is, is that in this time, it's very much gone. Friday, we get paid, and then it just seems like it's gone in for whatever reason, whether it's paying for car stuff or paying your bills and rent. But then it just feels like it's going out, and you don't really have anything coming in. And uh, one of the areas where I felt really challenged with that is feeling like this way that I've been doing it for so long has not really worked. And now we're in a situation where I need to be, well, I got challenged by God to say, well, what are you going to do about that now that you know that this is not really working? Let's look at that. And how can, how can I change that? And so part of that was the challenge of looking at tithing and going, you know what, uh, in an earthly sense, I'm not doing something that's working very well. Um, so I need to look at a heavenly response to this situation. And uh, that's when I started uh, looking into tithing. And full honesty, I've never tithed before, uh, about a month ago. And was in a situation where I thought, you know what, we've just got to give it a go. We've got to trust and have faith that God understands my needs and he's going to meet them. But then also... I need to sacrifice in order to give to this situation because that's an area of my life which is not really under God's control. And uh, as I've done that in God's wonderful, gentle correction way, it's been a challenge. And the first time I gave, it was a real, real heart sort of moment where I was like, oh, I actually have to do this if I'm going to believe this. <laughs> oh, that doesn't feel great. And then actually that really was a revealing moment for me of like, well, actually, who's in control here? Who's the one who's in control of your finances? And this really brought up a resistance in me and realized that this is an area that I need to give over to God and really trust in faith that, you know, this is not, he doesn't need my money, but he needs my heart. And that's what this is really about, is actually making sure that my heart is in the right place. And... Uh, yeah, as I've been challenged by this, uh, the results have, you know, it's not like I've just got a Range Rover on my front lawn all of a sudden, uh, not prosperity gospel kind of thing, but it's been a changing of my attitude towards it and giving God that first 10%, even though, as Matt said, it's, it's all his, but actually it's about where's this provision coming from. And especially over the last year, I've noticed, you know, four jobs in one year, you kind of go, well, actually, <laughs> jobs can come and go, but... God's provision is always going to be there, and God's heart is always going to be there for who you are as a person, as a human being. Um, and so even just in the past sort of month, I felt much calmer about finances. It's always been something that I've stressed about. It's always been something that has always been a concern and taking up a lot of mental energy. But that has now started to reduce, which is fantastic. And actually, there's been that freedom to just kind of go, this is in God's hands, and it's in God's control. So I need to trust into that. And uh, yeah, it's just been another area with feeling God's wisdom as well of going well look God I've got this I'm going to give you my tithe but is there anything else you want me to give towards 
and also is the is there a better way that I can manage my money in a biblical sense and what can I do about that and uh, yeah so that's what we're into at the moment and uh, that's my current journey Okay, so we're going to come into a landing here. So can we just have, uh, Emmanuel, the next verse on there? Uh, I just want to ask, how on earth are we going to do this? How on earth are we going to be people that sort of embody some of the generosity and embark in some of the journey that Adam's just been sharing? Uh, I just want to read this verse. So this is just carrying on from the grace of giving. I'm not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that through his poverty we might become rich. Jesus faced the onslaught of greed and sin and idolatry. He lived a perfect life. He's broken the power of greed. And at the cross he takes the punishment that we deserved. And by trusting in him, his victory becomes our victory. Freedom from the pull of materialism and money is available as we put our trust and hope in Jesus. Amen? Amen. Do you want to stand? I'm going to pray, and then Hannah's going to lead us in worship. Heavenly Father, do pray that just for everyone in the room, as they hear this talk on giving and generosity in different ways, uh, that more than anything they would know you, King Jesus, inviting them deeper into trust and relationship with you. Thank you. A bit like Adam said, that the giving is just a a way for God to have access to his heart. And so, God, we pray that we would be very open-handed at this point, that we wouldn't be guarded, and that we would come to you, King Jesus, and say, it's all yours. Everything I have is a blessing from you. Help me to use my resources in a way that blesses you, blesses others. In Jesus' name.